carried brandy and M&Ms. Until he was shot, Ted Lavender carried the Starlight Scope, which weighed 6.3 pounds with its aluminum carrying case. Henry Dobbins carried his girlfriend's pantyhose wrapped around his neck as a comforter. They all carried ghosts. When dark came, they would move out, single file across the meadows and paddies to their ambush coordinates, where they would quietly set up the claymores and lie down and spend the night waiting. Other missions were more complicated and required special equipment. In mid-April, it was their mission to search out and destroy the elaborate tunnel complexes in the Than Ke area south of Chu Lai. To blow the tunnels, they carried one-pound blocks of pentrite high explosives, four blocks to a man, 68 pounds in all. They carried wiring detonators and battery-powered clackers. Dave Jensen carried earplugs. Most often, before blowing the tunnels, they were ordered by higher command to search them, which was considered bad news. But by and large, they just shrugged and carried out orders. Because he was a big man, Henry Dobbins was excused from tunnel duty. The others would draw numbers. Before Lavender died, there were 17 men in the platoon, and whoever drew the number 17 would strip off his gear and crawl in head first with a flashlight and Lieutenant Cross's 45 caliber pistol. The rest of them would fan out as security. They would sit down or kneel, not facing the hole, listening to the ground beneath them, imagining cobwebs and ghosts, whatever was down there, the tunnel walls squeezing in, how the flashlight seemed impossibly heavy in the hand, and how it was tunnel vision in the very strictest sense Compression in all ways, even time, and how you had to wiggle in, ass and elbows, a swallowed-up feeling, and how you found yourself worrying about odd things. Will your flashlight go dead? Do rats carry rabies? If you screamed, how far would the sound carry? Would your buddies hear it? Would they have the courage to drag you out? In some respects, though not many, the waiting was worse than the tunnel itself, Imagination was a killer. On April 18th, when Lee Strunk drew the number 17, he laughed and muttered something and went down quickly. The morning was hot and very still. Not good, Kiowa said. He looked at the tunnel opening, then out across a dry paddy toward the village of Than Ke. Nothing moved. No clouds or birds or people. As they waited, the men smoked and drank Kool-Aid, not talking much, feeling sympathy for Lee Strunk, but also feeling the luck of the draw. You win some, you lose some, said Mitchell Sanders, and sometimes you settle for a rain check. It was a tired line, and no one laughed. Henry Dobbins ate a tropical chocolate bar. Ted Lavender popped a tranquilizer and went off to pee. After five minutes... Lieutenant Jimmy Cross moved to the tunnel, leaned down, and examined the darkness. Trouble, he thought, a cave-in, maybe. And then, suddenly, without willing it, he was thinking about Martha. The stresses and fractures, the quick collapse, the two of them buried alive under all that weight, dense, crushing love, Kneeling, watching the hole, he tried to concentrate on Lee Strunk and the war, all the dangers, but his love was too much for him. He felt paralyzed. He wanted to sleep inside her lungs and breathe her blood and be smothered. He wanted her to be a virgin and not a virgin all at once. He wanted to know her. Intimate secrets. Why poetry? Why so sad? Why that grayness in her eyes? Why so alone? Not lonely, just alone, riding her bike across campus or sitting off by herself in the cafeteria, even dancing. She danced alone, and it was the aloneness that filled him with love. He remembered telling her that one evening, how she nodded and looked away, and how later when he kissed her, 
She received the kiss without returning it, her eyes wide open, not afraid, not a virgin's eyes, just flat and uninvolved. Lieutenant Cross gazed at the tunnel, but he was not there. He was buried with Martha under the white sand at the Jersey shore. There they were pressed together, and the pebble in his mouth was her tongue. He was smiling. Vaguely, he was aware of how quiet the day was, the sullen patties, yet he could not bring himself to worry about matters of security. He was beyond that. He was just a kid at war. In love, he was 22 years old. He couldn't help it. A few moments later, Lee Strunk crawled out of the tunnel. He came up, grinning, filthy, but alive. Lieutenant Cross nodded and closed his eyes while the others clapped Strunk on the back and made jokes about rising from the dead. Worms, Rat Kylie said, right out of the grave, f***ing zombie. The men laughed. They all felt great relief. Spook City, said Mitchell Sanders. Lee Strunk made a funny ghost sound, a kind of moaning, yet very happy. And right then, when Strunk made that high, happy moaning sound, when he went, ooh, right then... Ted Lavender was shot in the head on his way back from peeing. He lay with his mouth open. The teeth were broken. There was a swollen black bruise under his left eye. The cheekbone was gone. Oh, sh... Rat Kylie said, The guy's dead. The guy's dead. He kept saying which seemed profound. The guy's dead. I mean, really? The things they carried were determined to some extent by superstition. Lieutenant Cross carried his good luck pebble. Dave Jensen carried a rabbit's foot. Norman Boker, otherwise a very gentle person, carried a thumb that had been presented to him as a gift by Mitchell Sanders. The thumb was dark brown, rubbery to the touch, and weighed four ounces at most. It had been cut from a V.C. corpse, a boy of 15 or 16. They'd found him at the bottom of an irrigation ditch, badly burned, flies in his mouth and eyes. The boy wore black shorts and sandals. At the time of his death, he had been carrying a pouch of rice, a rifle, and three magazines of ammunition. You want my opinion? Mitchell Sanders said. There's a definite moral here. He put his hand on the dead boy's wrist. He was quiet for a time, as if counting a pulse. Then he patted the stomach almost affectionately and used Kiowa's hunting hatchet to remove the thumb. Henry Dobbins asked what the moral was. Moral? You know, moral. Sanders wrapped the thumb in toilet paper and handed it across to Norman Boker. There was no blood. Smiling, he kicked the boy's head, watched the flies scatter, and said, It's like that old TV show. Paladin, have gun, will travel. Henry Dobbins thought about it. Yeah, well, he finally said, I don't see no moral. There it is, man. Fuck off. They carried USO stationery and pencils and pens. They carried sterno, safety pins, trip flares, signal flares, spools of wire, razor blades, chewing tobacco, liberated jaw sticks, and statuettes of the smiling Buddha. Candles, grease pencils, the stars and stripes, fingernail clippers, psyops, leaflets, bush hats, bolos, and much more. Twice a week, when the resupply choppers came in, they carried how chow in green mermite cans and large canvas bags filled with iced beer and soda pop. They carried plastic water containers, each with a two-gallon capacity. <laughs> 